Thank you for tuning in to CITR 101.9 FM. You're listening to Democracy Watch, the news collective's weekly, hour-long news report, bringing you alternative and undercovered current affair coverage from Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. I'm Alex DeBoer. I'm Christina Song. And I'm Zoe Powell. It's Thursday, April 12th at 5.05 p.m. We're broadcasting from UBC's Vancouver campus on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam-speaking Musqueam people. Today is the 2017-2018 final episode of Democracy Watch. As such, we will be approaching the show a little bit differently this week. Today, instead of presenting headlines and original reporting, we'll be revisiting past Democracy Watch stories and discussing where those stories are at now. We'll also be adding some media analysis by discussing our coverage and the coverage provided by other media outlets. All right, so I was planning on starting this episode out uh, by talking a bit about the show itself. Um, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but the show is called Democracy Watch, as we just mentioned. Um, <laughs> it was previously called News 101. So this year, one of the changes we made, I actually made it myself as the News Collective Coordinator, so it wasn't a super democratic choice, though it's called Democracy Watch. Democracy's slow. Um, so. <laughs> Democracy's slow. Someone has to start it out. <laughs> yeah. So um, we changed the name, and so we wanted to have a bit more of a presence of the power of journalism. Um, and journalism obviously works to inform citizens so that they can make decisions based on facts, based on understanding the trans uh, transparencies of publicly elected officials, and that they can participate fully in society and so that democracy can exist. So that was sort of the thought behind the name. It was also taken slightly inspired by democracy now um objectivity does not exist so <laughs> okay um so just wanted to touch on that so the first story we're going to get into is um a story reported on by myself ramatula shek and ryan patrick jones on january 25th 2018. so um this story is called tim horton's fight for 15. Um, so we covered a protest that took place outside the Tim Hortons on Commercial and First. Um, that was on Friday, January 19th. Um, this protest was organized by Fight for 15, a campaign um, that took place in BC and happened at two different Tim Hortons that same day. One was in the morning, one was at night. Um, and it was part of a day of action in support of Tim Hortons workers. So if we can recall back in January, this is around the time that Ontario's minimum wage hiked up to, I think it was $14 an hour, um, not, and it didn't do so gradually, so it was, it, was, it was sort of sudden. And some Tim Hortons, as they are franchises, uh, took those losses in profits out on their um, workers and cut benefits or cut hours and such. So this um, event was in reaction to that. So in this episode, we interviewed a couple people. We interviewed two activists outside of the Tim Hortons, and then we later interviewed a UBC Sauter business professor, Mark Thompson. So first, I'm just going to play a clip from um, a activist outside Tim Hortons. Um, he's part of um, a socialist group, and uh, let's go to that, and then we'll continue the discussion. We first interviewed William, who is a member of the Vancouver Socialist Alternative Group. Here's what he had to say about the objectives of this planned agitation. We're protesting the clawback of benefits and um, general mistreatment of workers by the Tim Hortons franchise. Um, so they're taking away benefits, they're taking away paid breaks, and the most sort of vindictive one is that they're not allowed uh, free drinks anymore. Which, when you think about how much coffee they throw away during the day because of their 20 minute fresh rule, how much food and drinks these workers are supposed to throw away throughout the day and they're not allowed to have any of it, I mean, that's just a Dickensian level of greed. All right. Yeah. So that was um, that was a an activist outside Tim Hortons. And he was obviously very passionate about what he was talking about and the just sort of visceral greed of um, Tim Hortons. Uh, and I I think um, we also found that in the other activist we spoke with, who was a member of QP, who was um, uh, speaking about the benefits of unions for workers and how unions and a 
guaranteed living wage um, can work to um, obviously like give workers what they need and to prevent such um, actions as took place on January 19th. Um, so we also interviewed a professor because we wanted to delve a bit more into the economics of the situation, which is something I'm definitely not an expert on. Um, so we were interested in um, how this might have played out differently, like how different organizations in Canada have responded to hikes in minimum wage and if there's a way for companies to increase minimum wage without making their workers absorb that loss in profits. So um, we talked to this professor, Mark Thompson. We're going to play a clip of this in a minute. And he, um, I've, I chose this clip because I think it's it's interesting in his perspective on who these workers are at, at Tim Hortons and and he sort of sees them as like transient workers, possibly or likely young people. This is like he sees these jobs as very temporary. And I sort of um, disagreed with him. So let's take a listen to this and then we'll talk about it. We wanted to delve further on this topic on uh, of minimum wage. We interviewed Mark Thompson, a professor emeritus at UBC Sauder School of Business. Okay, so there's this there's this uh, contrast between raising the minimum wage uh, from eleven to fourteen dollars right away and doing it gradually. So Tim Hortons might make the argument if you had raised the minimum wage gradually in Ontario, we wouldn't have responded in such a way, cutting workers' benefits and their hours and such. But I mean, the bottom line is that Tim Hortons wants to keep their their profits margin at what it is, right? So even if they increase the minimum wage gradually, wouldn't they still find ways to make workers absorb those uh, that increase in wages? Well, it, 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 it depends on the circumstances. They run the risk that they lose their employees. That's the first thing. Right. Uh, I mean, these are not, for most people, they're not career jobs. You don't expect yeah. to be pouring coffee at Tim Hortons all your life at a, basically a minimum wage. So, and those jobs are always, they're always available. You just walk around town and you see help wanted in front of a retail establishment. You know, it's those are minimum wage but jobs. But a lot so, of the workers there you know, are immigrants. They with their feet, you know. Yeah, but a lot of the people there are are maybe immigrants and don't have a lot of options, and so maybe those jobs are, aren't they like fairly often not just temporary jobs? Well, they're not temporary jobs in the in the sense that they're they're always there, right? And the uh, uh, but they're not jobs that you keep for life, you know. I mean, there's high turnover, and uh, if people don't like their way of being treated. At Tim Hortons, they'll look around for one of the other chains, you know. All right. So that was an interesting clip, I think, um, what you guys thought of it. But so, okay, so I think what we're seeing here is like a reflection in sort of a generational understanding of what coffee shop or who coffee shop workers are. Um, so perhaps from this professor um, his generation, he is seeing Tim Hortons as being a place where teenagers go to work, make some money after school, um, those type of things, like the kind of job you have as a first job or a second job, um, or something maybe you do very part time while you're in school or going to university, whatever. Um, and so he he says, for most people, these are not career jobs. Um, so I think that what's interesting about this is that that's not necessarily true. Um, if we look at Tim Hortons today, I don't know about you guys, but when I walk into a Tim Hortons, I find that generally it is women working there. And of course, this is my observation. This doesn't count for every Tim Hortons in BC or in Canada or even in Vancouver. But uh, my observation in the Lower Mainland, and I have been to a fair bit of a fair few Tim Hortons. <laughs> my parents love Tim Hortons or Timmy's, as it's called. Uh, Ramatula loves Tim Hortons too, but he's not here sadly. <laughs> Um, anyway, I digress. Um, so uh, when I go in there, generally, I find it's like m middle aged women, a lot of like immigrants. And I mean, you have to wonder, like, is this not a career job for some people? Um, I mean, sometimes people 
come to a new country or are in a situation in life where this is where they're working. And so I think that what the professor is arguing is that, you know, if these are just temporary jobs, the workers have more power, right? Because then they can quit their jobs and be like, I'm going to look for work somewhere else. Like this is something that I wasn't going to do forever anyways. But the reality is if that's not the case, then they're kind of trapped in these jobs a bit more than um, he's giving them uh, credit for. And if they're trapped, it, it they lose leverage. Like what can you do if you need a job? Like, I mean, and that's kind of the whole thing here, I think. Yes. Um, and- yeah. Like a bit of detail on the high turnover rate, I think, is that some people, I mean, there in these jobs, there probably is a higher than normal tar- turnover rate. But how many people are quitting those jobs and going to another minimum wage job? So right. they're not moving moving up or to a, to a job that um, that will give them hi- a higher wage. They're just going to a different job, which is still uh, falls under minimum wage. So Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And is it really a lot better? I mean, that's the whole thing about minimum wage is it's standardized. And in companies like Tim Hortons, like large companies with a lot of workers doing quote unquote menial work, they're going to pay whatever minimum wage is. So is it better to go work at like, I don't know, Starbucks? Maybe. I think they do have some benefits, right? I think think Starbucks has health. Yeah. Health or something. Actually, you know what? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Besides, Tim Hortons isn't owned by... Uh, Canadian company anyway anymore. Um, did you have anything to say about that? No, um, I think we were kind of debating whether there there will be an impact on like the company itself because mm-hmm. their shareholders might not think that it's a big deal that people are offended by their um, business tactics. Right. But um, actually, b- because because they're um, foreign investors. But actually, Tim Hortons has been getting a lot of flack overseas as well. Um, so I think m- perhaps the shareholders who are you know, probably international, but the company itself is in Brazil, they probably heard mm-hmm. something about it. And they feel that it's a risk um, to invest so heavily in a company that's l- losing popularity in Canada. And that could reflect in their stock yeah, prices. Totally, which might be the only reason, which is almost definitely the only reason they would make changes, right, is they're beholden to their um, their stock owners, their shareholders, is what I should say. Um, okay, so now, just to bring you up to speed on where the story's at now, um, as we all know, in uh, February, John Horgan, our uh, BC Premier, announced that minimum wage will be going up. Um, so by 2021, minimum wage earners will now make fifteen twenty an hour. Um, so just refer to my notes here. Um, the first increase is going to come on June 1st, 2018. So that's pretty soon. Um, and the minimum wage will go from what it is now, which is 11.35 per hour to 12.65 per hour. Um, so that's, that's all, uh, well and good. That's the first step. The second one is a year from that, which is in June 1st, 2019. It goes up to 13.85. Then it's set to, in 2020, go up to 1460 and then in 2021, go up to 1520 So I think that these dates are still not set in stone, but this was what was recommended by the Fair Wages Commission. So that's what the plan is right now. So um, it's kind of interesting because, um, like, Christina and I were talking about this back on Monday, and... So we're thinking like, okay, so the Fight for 15 movement actually began in New York um, and it began in 2012. So $15 in 2012. In American dollars. In American dollars. <laughs> what is that compared to $15 in 2018 in Canadian dollars? And what is that compared to $15 in 2021? Like, to give, that's bananas. Yeah, to give a little bit of perspective, I believe... Um, uh, a living wage in Vancouver was estimated to be over $22 in 2016. So that right. was two years ago, which means that even if um, minimum $15 was implemented now, it's still quite a bit under a uh, fair living wage. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, also, um, just to give perspective for other places in Canada, um, companies in Alberta are appear to be adjusting um, also to a hike that they had recently, um, which was from 12, 
20 to 1360, which is in last October. So in Alberta, our neighboring province, their minimum wage is now 1360. Um, and they're getting ready for further increases also to $15 this year. So we're lagging behind Alberta substantially, important to note. And then as we all know, what spurred this all was the minimum wage hike in Ontario, which is now at 14. Um, so right now, BC is like the most expensive place to live and pays the least for minimum wage work. Um, so this is kind of a long time coming. But it definitely it's like w- one thing we were talking about as well is like, why 15? Is that an arbitrary number? So I think we were talking about it on Monday as well, uh, about um, how it could have been because it's an alliteration. It's alliteration, for sure. Yeah, like, and it just fight sounds for good. 15. It sounds fight great. For 20. I don't know. Fight for does, doesn't have 14. The same ring. Actually, that's not bad. The movement started in 2012 in New York maybe, City. Maybe the minimum wage in New York City that was available was 15. Sorry, our news comrade Olamide has something to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that maybe, like in New York in 2012, according to like U.S. dollars, uh, $15 was the living minimum wage at that point in time, right? I mean, you that, that's that there's true. more to it than just yeah. alliteration. Yeah, as exactly. a, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're totally right. We were just speculating. Yes, we're speculating, of we're course. We're speculating. But we have to keep in mind that, like, for Canada, the um, rate of inflation is pretty close to 2% a year. Nice. So in twenty or in ten years, that that means that there's there should be around twenty percent increase from the previous wage. Yes. Um. I think there is a lot of like data and like research on like basically how wages and you know labor and like you know accumulation of capital and like inflation and all that stuff. And like if you look at the trends, you see that wages and inflation haven't really been keeping up to par with each other. Like right. inflation. Uh, like the last 30 years, inflation has been, you know, like there's been prices have been increasing, right? And wages have more or less stayed stagnant since like the 1970s, right? So it's just one of those like interesting things that like, hey, like we can't really make the complaint that like if you increase the minimum wage that like every single business is going to suffer when like for the past few years, you haven't been paying fair wages to workers for their labor, given the actual um, like living wage and like due to inflation, right? So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, definitely yeah. in the last uh, few decades, what's good for the company has not been good for the worker. Yeah, totally. Um, wow, since the 1970s, hey? That's that's pretty crazy. Um, so I was looking at some media coverage of this. Um, so we, our coverage, to analyze that a bit. Okay, so there we had some reporters, myself included, outside the Tim Hortons. So we were talking to the protesters and activists. Um, we did try to talk to Tim Hortons workers, um, included in the piece is us going up to the counter at Tim Hortons on commercial and first and asking the workers there if they would like to speak to us. They declined. Understandable. They're probably under a lot of pressure and don't want to lose their jobs or for whatever reason, I shouldn't speculate, they declined to speak to us. Um, and we did not reach out to the larger corporation for comment. Um, so, you know, um, that's what I honestly, I doubt they would have spoken to us we sometimes get usually we try to reach out to the company at large if we're covering a protest but um most of the time they're not able to get back to us um or they send like a statement so anyway so we did not reach out to tim horton so that's something um i was looking at other coverage of um the fight for 15 movement and like um this and the announcement of the minimum wage going up, which Horgan announced in February. And obviously, like generally the coverage uh, depended on the n- news outlets leanings. Um, so like Global News, um, they were interviewing a lot of people in this one piece uh, and biz- like business owners and restaurant owners. And the- they were all saying, you know, like, oh, I'm going to have to fire people and stuff like this is hard for our business to absorb. And then, you know, other sources like the Georgia Strait um, talk about how, you know, this is like something that will be uh, that local businesses will be able to absorb with like predictable increases in wage. And it's really just the like the least the government can do considering the cost of living here. So, yeah, it really varied. But the economics of it all is really interesting to me. Um, How many because the real issue is. 
um, how many small businesses are there who have to pay their employees a higher wage. And like, I think we calculated this as well, and it was like 30 or 40 percent of business in right, BC. Right, in Canada. In Canada. Are small businesses, um, or sorry, 35 percent of minimum wage workers are employed by small businesses. Yeah. So yeah. I think, well, that is a, that is quite a large chunk, but yeah, I think um, I think like pe- when people who are making minimum wage get a boost in their income, they're mm-hmm. not going to be spending it on some foreign investment, like people who are in higher income it, brackets. Yeah, that's a really so good point. So they're going to you know f- send all of this cash back into local businesses. I don't really see how protecting b- small businesses is a really great argument for keeping minimum wage low. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. Um, All right, well, uh, we're going to go to a short break. Um, Stay tuned. This is Democracy Watch on CITR 11.9 FM. When we come back, we'll be revisiting an episode we did um, a few months ago, a couple months ago, on fish farming. So stay tuned. LGBTQ2I Night is a positive space for folks to learn about bike maintenance in a relaxed environment led by queer mechanics and volunteers. It takes place on the fourth Wednesday of every month at the Bike Kitchen on UBC's campus. Bring your own bike and fix them with our tools, come with questions and ask away, or learn by watching other folks work on their bikes. Beginners are always welcome. This event is entirely free to attend and there will be free pizza. For more information, visit bikecoop.ca. When you join Balloon Club, we guarantee that you will be able to make a balloon poodle within the first day. Here at the UBC Ant Club, we just like to talk about ants and compare ant farms. Uh, It's really cool. Paperclip Club is all about, well, paperclips mostly. At Blah Club, you can blah blah, blah 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 blah. Explosion! There's only one club worth joining at UBC, and that's CITR 101.9 FM. We got free tickets to shows, whirly pops, professional help in all types of audio engineering, passes to festivals, crazy parties, live band swag, all types of crazy people. Our programming manager rides a motorcycle. There's freestyle rapping, Nardwar, the human serviette, the vinyl and record libraries, Discord or magazine, free studio recording, and it sure beats the hell out of Paperclip Club, which is a thing that I just made up because I work at CITR. So come check us out on the floor of the Student Union Building. We got all types of crazy shit for you to do. Or check us out online at www.citr.ca. Allow me to tell you about Unseated Airways. What's that? Isn't that some kind of indigenous radio show? It sure is. Tell me, are you down for decolonization? Yeah. What? I certainly wish I could hear about indigenous issues, people, and events on the radio. You're in luck, because Unseated Airwaves talks about all these things and more every Monday morning at 11. Music from indigenous artists and coverage of all the hot happenings in indigenous art and entertainment. On CITR 101.9 FM. Oh wow, and they broadcast all this from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory yeah. of the Musqueam people? Find out for yourself, mm-hmm. Monday mornings at 11, yeah. or find episodes online at citr.ca. Today we're joined yeah. in the studio by the Cedar Program Youth. Where you are at? <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to Democracy Watch on 101.9 FM. Um, so the next clip we're going to play for you is um, our coverage of a fundraiser for the fight against fish farming um, at the Unitarian Church of Vancouver on February 22nd. My name is Kwakwa Balas. My English name is Ernest Alford, and I'm from the Namkis uh, at Alert Bay. On August 24th, that's nearly six months ago, we declared an occupation. My niece and myself went out to uh, Swanson Island Fish Farm 
and we brought our tents and our sleeping bags and we decided that we were going to sit there and we were going to wait until uh, we had some clear answers about the tenure licenses that the province has issued so these farms could operate. Now it's a multi-jurisdictional mess because they've broken up the responsibilities between the federal government and the provincial government but when we realized that all of the farms within the Broughton Archipelago are expiring and that the province has the authority to not renew them. We became very excited and we there's a glimmer of hope here. The provincial government has taken certain steps um, to, you know, reconcile with First Nations people and um, they speak a different language than the previous governments that we've had and so we're quite I'm very optimistic and feeling quite powerful um, that we are in fact winning this fight against this Norwegian companies okay so that was um, Chief Ernest Alfred of the Namgis nation um, and so a couple things have happened since then. Um, as recently in March. Um, oh, sorry, what was happening then? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so actually. Quick recap. <laughs> right. The, the event was um, a fundraiser and um, raising awareness against um, fish farming um, in BC because there are several fish farms that are operating open net farms in BC. Um, and the First Nations are very much against it because it. There have been several research um, pointing out that um, it's infecting the wild salmon, and um, the First Nations communities, um, of course, rely heavily on um, sam wild salmon and wild salmon um, fishing. So they were. They're very concerned that they're going to spread um, Piscine Rio virus and um, sea lice, um, which can come, because these um, farm salmon, which by the way are Atlantic salmon and not Pacific, um, they are kept in open nets. So um, they, they can easily infect any uh, wild salmon that passes by them, which is pretty often. And I think there have been several studies and there have been very a lot of petitions, including the David Suzuki Foundation, who also, um, Sponsored the fundraiser th that night, um, who who who's telling the who are telling the government, you know, you really have to be concerned more uh, about the effect of farmed salmon on um, British Columbia's coastal waters. Also, it seems like BC is going to be the only place where famines. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Salmon farming is going to be allowed on open waters in the West Coast. That means um, uh, recently Washington has passed a law um, outlawing um, farm salmon, and um, it's kind of um, hypocritical when um, our sort of our Canadian image is to be like a little bit more right. greener than our American neighbors, and we are not even doing what Seattle is doing or Washington. Yeah, and how recently did Washington um, pass that policy that there's no longer open net fish uh, Atlantic farm? You know, fishing? I'm not sure about the date, but uh, and I don't think it has been completely um, implemented yet. But they are phasing them out as we speak. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, and I think also, but BC itself has an opportunity to phase them out as soon as this summer because. As we have spoken before, their tenure is about to um, expire. So these tenures allow, they're like licenses for these fish farms to operate. And they are going to be, uh, many of them are going to be um, expiring in June. And that's right. why there has been so much movement right now. Right, right, right. Okay. So, yeah. So where are we at right now then? So this um, there's been a report from a provincial advisory council saying that BC should seriously consider um, having getting uh, First Nations people to grant permission before giving out the tenures. And it doesn't seem likely that um, the First Nations community would give out permission because they're deeply, deeply against um, salmon farming and they have been very outspoken and they've been sitting in on protests as like um, Ernest, Chief Ernest Alfred has mentioned. Right. 
And but then in March, um, there ha- they, the First Nations community also um, filed an injunction against the restocking of um, fish fish farms because they they said that you know it's sorry no if, if the ten years get expired in June yeah what are they going to do with all the salmon that they just restocked right like there has to be there has to be some sort of like way of disposing of them or and these companies are going to lose profit and they're going to s- cite that as a reason why tenure should continue. Okay, so where we're at now, like tell me if I understand this correctly, is that we are waiting for these tenures to either expire or be renewed in June. And right now the agriculture minister is recommending that they that uh, um, the industry or these companies get approval from First Nations. So the... Um the Minister of um, Agriculture Agriculture in BC hasn't said that she will like ask for permission, um, but an advisory council for the province has recommended this, and she said okay. that she will take this in- under advisement. Okay, so right now we're just hanging in the balance. Like, the, f- the fate of open net fish farming is hanging in the balance, yes. and we'll find out in June. Yes, yeah. basically. Yeah, I mean, that's... Um, that's a very serious upcoming <laughs> news event. Um, and in, I mean, in terms of what our coverage has added to this story, um, I think that's part of it as well. Like something that's really significant is that these kind of things are normally like these slow burn, ongoing issues which don't make it into the mainstream news media because it's not like one big event. But yeah, right. like you said, the future of this is literally hanging in the balance. It's these ongoing things and there is a lot of scope to change policies in this kind of area but the fact that it's not covered until it becomes some sort of huge deal means that it's not really in the public awareness a lot so I thought Christina's piece on it like really sort of broke into that like I don't know temporal disjuncture that the mainstream media has with these kinds of issues and actually brought it into the light so watching democracy you know wow, that's our mandate disjuncture wow. thank you uh, so he's very those, smart those so are, yeah and <laughs> also very flattering <laughs> what are you in grad school or something <laughs> we paid five thousand dollars for that word yeah, yeah. <laughs> still good <got> student debt <laughs> no that's true that's a really good point um yeah because we have covered this um because of christina's um interest and work in it uh not work but um, willingness to cover these events. Um, but it hasn't really taken a large spot in the general news media in the mainstream. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, that probably, I would say to your comments, Zoe, is that probably speaks to um, the lack of funding for journalism. <laughs> um, that, you know, we have to, we being like the industry has to prioritize um, stories that are the most quote unquote ner- newsworthy. And so, you know, um, something that's sort of a slow burn story uh, perhaps won't receive as much coverage as would be ideal. Right. And I think it also uh, goes to, sh- it's sort of part of like who who benefits from having this story being shared. And um, right. it's for Trans Mountain, I think like there, there has been a lot of coverage, but only because there has been massive protests and it, it's so incredibly visible. But yeah, but for these small um, First Nations communities, they are not nearly as visible. Yeah, and it's sort of a, a regionalized issue in that it's like on the coast of the ocean. And so um, if you're not directly um, consuming the salmon there or the wildlife, you might overlook it. Whereas um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, you know, affects everyone and is going through a large geographical region. Though, I mean, of course, like salmon, people eat salmon from all over, but but yeah, <laughs> I'm not okay, saying balls. salmon isn't super important. Everybody um, likes sushi. <laughs> people like sushi. Yeah, that is very true. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else to say on this piece? Um, nope, I'm good. I think I said what I wanted to say. <laughs> well, um, you've done great work. I think we'll just go to... Uh, should we go to Zoe to talk first on uh, Zoe Power, our news comrade, who has been a part of the collective for, I think, the second semester is that, or first semester, too? No, Mostly. just the second just one. Just the second semester of school. Um, however, she had a class on the date of 
our show this time, Thursdays at 5. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the first because exams are now uh, happening and, and school is actually over for the semester. Technically, classes are over. This is her first actual show she's attending. So welcome, Zoe. And if you want to tell us about a story that you liked or want to say something about from Democracy Watch this year, please. Please go ahead. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's terrifying in the studio. It's a, <laughs> a high-paced game. Right. Um, so I am yeah have very bad reading comprehension. So when Alex asked the collective members to pick a story that they liked from the semester, I picked an entire episode of Democracy Watch. Um, it was an episode that I had literally nothing to do with the reporting of. Uh, maybe that's why it was such a good episode. Who knows? Oh. Um, but it's the episode from March 15th. Um, and the topics that we covered in this episode was there was a extensive audio report from the Tibetan Uprising Day rallies in downtown Vancouver near the Chinese embassy. Um, we covered the release of the Carnegie Community Action Project housing report for 2018 and had an interview with someone who put that out. Um, and we also, our uh, reporter Arika Riaz was interviewing the rabbi David Masavia, who was defending himself in court that day against an injunction issued by Kinder Morgan. Um, so what I thought was really beautiful about the way this episode worked um, is that two of these are, well, one of them is an exceptionally local issue, right? Like housing in the downtown east side, sort of the decline of SROs is a very local lower mainland issue, um, something that definitely doesn't make it into a lot of headlines across Canada. Um, the Kinder Morgan versus the rabbi issue is, I guess, somewhere in the middle. Uh, definitely a lower mainland focus, but also more relevant across all of Canada as well, as we were just saying. <laughs> um, but we also covered, yeah, this Tibetan Uprising Day rally, which would seem, I guess, to me, before I listened to the episode, to not necessarily be strictly within the Democracy Watch mandate. It's this big global issue, right? It's not lower mainland specific, but actually the way that this report was done, like really expertly focused it on the lower mainland and on how this dynamic has been changing within that community here over the last few years. So we've got this uh, audio clip um, from that piece reporting on the Tibetan Day Uprising that we're going to play for you right now. And to honor those who have given their lives to resist Chinese colonization, this is where the demands become louder. While at the protest, the Democracy Watch team met Ladin Tatong. She has been attending the Uprising Day protests in Vancouver at the same spot since she was a kid. We asked her about the significance of the protest. So my name is Ladin Tatong uh, and I am here protesting for Tibetan freedom and for Tibetan independence from Chinese rule. We, I grew up actually here, I don't live here anymore, but I grew up on uh, Vancouver Island, coming here every year to protest with my family, with our very small but very feisty Tibetan community here in Vancouver, uh, coming to this very location outside the Chinese consulate to demand freedom and to shine a light on them for what they're doing in Tibet, for the human rights violations, uh, all the things that they hope the world will not see or will forget. Uh, in terms of what they're doing to six million Tibetans inside Tibet over the past six decades. Every year when we come here, we let this day serve as a reminder both of the history that Tibetans inside Tibet rose up uh, March 10th, 1959, and that led to the escape of the Dalai Lama, but also to bring attention to the issue and the ongoing occupation, the repression, but most importantly, the resistance uh, that continues even this, to this very minute inside Tibet. How has the resistance here in the Lower Yeah, okay, so what you actually hear right there at the end of the clip is um, Alex's next question for, for Ladon, who they're interviewing, is about how the resistance in the Lower Mainland and in the Vancouver community specifically has changed over the years as well. Um, so what I thought was really impressive about the reporting on this piece was, first of all, it gave an extensive backstory um, about what Uprising Day actually is. And I think in news coverage of Tibet, it can tend to 
So does the details of what's actually happened in the past can tend to be pretty absent sometimes. Um, there's either a lot of assumed knowledge or a lot of silence on this topic. Um, but also this focus on making this issue a local issue. So Laden was speaking mm -hmm. extensively about the sort of the power of the Tibetan diaspora around the world and here in the Lower Mainland especially. Um, and she goes on to sort of talk about how recognition of this recognition of this issue has really changed over the last few years. Um, right. In terms of what was contained within the report, um, what was actually being reported on, maybe I'll even uh, pass this on over to Alex, who was actually there on the day. Um, but what they were covering was a, a protest which is held every year annually in the same place outside the Chinese embassy in Vancouver. Um, and yeah, it's on the anniversary of, of Uprising Day, you can probably say more about this. Yeah, I mean, Uprising Day is, um, it's kind of twofold. It's both a protest and a commemoration of the loss of lives that took place on March 10th, 1959. Um, at that time in history, Tibet was in the process of being colonized by China. And so um, the Chinese were in the, the uh, Tibetan capital of Lhasa. And uh, uh, there was a perceived threat to the His Holiness the Dalai Lama's life. Um, there was a there was a request for him to come, like the Dalai Lama, to come to like some show or some meeting alone without any of his usual cohort or bodyguards. And so people thought that perhaps there was an assassination attempt um, in the works. Anyway, a bunch of Tibetans rose up in Lhasa and kind of crowded around the location, the building that they thought he was in to protect him, though he actually wasn't in there. And um, the Chinese army uh, opened fire on them. So thousands were killed. So um, this commemoration day happens every year outside the Chinese consul in Vancouver, which is at Granville and 16th. And it's meant to commemorate that loss of lives and to celebrate the courage of those who rose up and to continue rising up um, against uh, human rights abuses in China and in occupied Tibet, which are enormous. Um, and so, yeah, it happens every year. There, that's the that's Uprising Day. Yeah, and it is. I mean, perhaps a pretty depressing story to put on a spreadsheet about um, what, where was this story at, and where is this story now? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's obviously a slow moving issue. Yeah. Um, but one thing that did really come out from the report, I think Gladham was talking about it and, and you've kind of touched on it now as well, is the fact that just the um, awareness and recognition of the human rights violations happening in Tibet have like increased dramatically over the last few years. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily since this report on March 15th, uh, but over the last couple of decades, certainly. Um, and there is here in the Lower Mainland community, there are events happening to educate people about this, right? Yeah, well, yeah, as Zoe said, um, well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that this issue is not really local, what like Uprising Day itself. But, um, you know, in in uh, commenting on the local Lower Mainland Tibetan Canadian community, um, I think that um, what has uh, what's maybe changed since then, since this um, protest and commemoration happened, is um, not a ton politically. Um, however, um, one thing I did notice recently is that DOXA, Vancouver's Documentary Film Festival, actually has an amazing program. Um, it's a self, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, what's it called when people um, study like another culture? Um, Anthropology? <laughs> no, but uh, ethnographic. Ethnographic. Thank you. That's the word. It escaped my mind. So it's a self ethnographic uh, collection of short films made about Tibetans by Tibetans. So it's kind of like challenging that sort of like Western ethnographic, National Geographic kind of um, subject viewer. <laughs> kind of relationship um so it's actually um as i said 11 short films and they take place in three different programs at doxa um three different shorts programs i'm super excited to see them um but why this is significant is that um it's hard for like in tibet you can't have a picture of the dalai lama you can't 
um, I think you can practice Buddhism in a limited sense, but like the culture is being um, disrupted in so many ways. Um, traditional herding has been essentially like removed, like the nomadic life. Um, people have been resettled into like permanent homes. Um, the Tibetan language is disappearing even from like the capital Lhasa and being replaced by Mandarin. Um, so to hear stories from Tibetans about them, to have those actually made in Tibet and, and brought out to the West, to the rest of the world is actually really amazing. Um, and I think these were probably um, safe to leave Tibet because they aren't overtly political in nature. I, I'm imagining um, because there is obviously a lot of like censorship. And if you were to make a film critical of Tibet in Tibet, you would probably face a lot of danger um, to the safety of yourself and your family. Anyway, so what's new is that at least, you know, as Laden mentioned, it seems that there is more general awareness of uh, what is happening in Tibet and like maybe more of an effort, at least locally in Vancouver, to showcase the stories of Tibetans. Um, so... Yeah, and I think um, this the story is sort of like um, about how even though it's a f it's like a it's um, an intern sorry for people who are actually in the locale where this is this event is occurring, their hands are tied to change the circumstances that they're yeah. in. However, through diplomatic um, pressures, I think the Chinese government can you know. Uh, better deal with or sorry not better deal with this but like i think diplomatic pressure is easier for us to um enforce rather yeah. than for the people inside oh absolutely yeah that's that's a really good point um another person we spoke to in that episode is maddie burnaby uh who has been a tibetan activist for a long time she's super knowledgeable i think she also did her phd in in some sort of like tibetan history um and so she's also been involved in advocating the Canadian government to regulate Canadian mining companies. You know how Canada, or sorry, BC has like 70, 80 percent of the world's mining companies based in BC. Um, obviously, there's sort of economic incentives for that. So she was part of a group um, lobbying to have this one group. I think it was China Gold, maybe it could be another group. I'm not sure. A certain mining company to enforce human uh, rights um, standards and environmental standards while in Tibet. And she and her, the other um, activists and organizers were successful in doing that. So absolutely, like within Tibet, you can't do anything really. And what, as you know, most people probably know, Tibetans often do is self uh, Im immolate. Am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah. Which is obviously super super tragic um so there's not much people can do i mean there there's no democracy obviously and there's no freedom of protest so absolutely um just having these people continue to come out every year to this protest um means a lot and obviously if they also like they're risking if they have any family in tibet um like that's super dangerous like there are security cameras outside the console and they know who everyone there is like they know who you are and so it's like you kind of are t like maddie for example is like i know i can never go to tibet again like I, she's not tibetan but um she uh has spent time there and and is very rooted in the tibetan community anyway so it's a risk even for people here but um it's uh it's the definitely worse yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you and you can actually accomplish something through, as you were saying, like diplomacy and advocacy at the like, government levels. Mm -hmm. So, but a and huge part corporate of that, levels, sorry, yeah. and corporate yeah. levels. Yeah. Totally, a, a big part of that as well is that these efforts to sort of advocate on those levels need to actually receive media attention and yeah. coverage as well, or they won't be successful. And I think. Um, I mean, in terms of what you were saying at the start of the show about changing our name from News 101 to Democracy Watch, I think like these last couple of stories, um, both this one and the one about the um, fish farming, are not yeah. really like News 101 stories, to mm -hmm. be honest. Like it's not about covering an event that's happening right now, but it is about bringing coverage to an ongoing issue of sort of injustice and violence, which is not going to receive a lot of attention necessarily otherwise. Um, so I don't know, Democracy Watch... Good name, I would say. Good mandate. <laughs> My goodness, thank you so much. <laughs> no, that's a good point to bring it back to, you know, media analysis. Yeah, um, I think that this show, like when I believe that there was no other coverage of this event, I'm pretty sure. 
That was yes. one of the reasons. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to say, where is Richard Gere on this now? Because, <laughs> like, I, I, oh, he's he still he loves the Dalai Lama. They're friends. They're friends, but oh, like, dude. he's not making speeches at like award shows anymore. Well, mm. maybe that's just his um, flagging star power. But <laughs> <laughs> and where is Richard Gere on fish farming? Like, I know. <laughs> when did he last come Girl, through no. for us? <laughs> no, but really, I think. Um, I, I just heard this thing, um, I don't know where, but it was so irritating to me when I heard it, was, was that um, Tibet was a co-celeb in the 90s, and then it sort of faded out. Yeah. So I think... You probably heard that from me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, you weren't being yeah. irritating, but the fact of the situation itself <laughs> was irritating. You yeah. Know what I mean? I mean, yeah, it's... Uh, the, yeah, that's why I was also surprised with Laden talking about how it's, like, gotten more popular. Because I feel like it's – it's I think that there are sort of waves of when, like, knowing what's happening in Tibet is trendy. And, like, Richard Gere and, and um, what's her name? Um, Goldie Hawn, I believe, also made, like, speeches at the Oscars or something about, you know, free Tibet when the issue was popular in the 90s. But, yeah, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um but yeah, I don't know. Zoe, did you have anything else to comment on for that story? No, I mean in terms of in terms of what you're just saying now about those ebbs and flows, though, I think that's um, I mean, interesting context for all of the things that people are, are saying are like hugely changing in the media today because people are talking about them at award shows as well. Um, maybe depressing context, but the fact that you're saying you know these it peaks and then attention of this issue kind of disappears and the attention can um disappear itself as well. Yeah. yeah, sounds yeah. like a depressing outlook for like <laughs> the yeah. Me Too movement and all of that. And people who are organizers of movements such as Me Too, I think they're like very, very aware that they have a certain time span in yeah. which they can like, raise awareness and create change before the next thing comes along. Yeah, and that's definitely true. Um, so we have just like a couple minutes here. I thought I would maybe just mention how. Speech. Uh, <laughs> Tell him about the cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's amazing. Christina made a cake for us. Uh, you may have seen it on Twitter. It's um, not fake. I know I'm speaking to a huge group of people right now, <laughs> a huge cohort of loyal followers who follow us on Twitter, Instagram. We don't have an Instagram. Facebook, <laughs> CITR.ca. And um, so something's playing. No, uh, maybe on my computer. I can hear something in the background. Anyway, okay, what I wanted to bring up was that Metro News is now owned by or rebranded as, like, Vancouver... The Star, Star the, Media. Yeah, Star Media, but it's, like, Vancouver Star Metro. Oh. Has everyone it's, seen that? It's, it's Star I Media did Vancouver, not see yeah. that. Star Metro Vancouver. I did listen to Cannonville. <laughs> like we talked about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Star because Metro Vancouver. We need yet another reminder that we live in the fringes of Canada. Uh-huh. Well, it's see, I honestly get a lot of news from Metro, and uh, one thing that is great is that they've hired what twelve new reporters oh. and new have new this reporters. big push. How, how many? I think twelve. Yeah. yeah, so twelve. Yeah, um, I think, and they have this big push for local journalism and investigative journalism, which are obviously like the two fields that most need funding and new reporters. Um, I will definitely agree with that. It'll be interesting to see um, what else changes with this. Um, and I'm interested also, I think, yeah, when this was talked about on Canada Land, um, the question of whether, whether Tor Star, who owns um, Star Metro Vancouver and all the other Metro papers, is planning on getting some of that uh, federal budget that was allotted for journalism, the, what, whopping $10 million. Um, so I don't know, be interesting to see both how, how that's paid for, how it pays off and how the reporting changes. I wonder if this is like sort of a ploy to get that federal grant. Yeah, it might be. Like, we're just increasing our local fund or local journalism. So yeah. yeah, yeah, they're probably, probably marketed it that way. That's and not probably just probably a pretty significant like structural force in funding for the industry as well is like responding to changing government grants and yeah totally restructuring yeah. Your well company it is to, to gain those yeah it has been in I mean it is for the CBC um, I don't know historically I don't think there's been a lot of or any government funding for newspapers is that true I, don't I think, think so. this is one of the first <laughs> I mean I'm it's sort only... of just saying that with no actual knowledge I mean, but from what I've heard. Yes, uh, aka this is how we operate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of funding just for journalism because journalism historically has been profitable, I'm guessing. Yes, until it has now. been in the past. Until but, now. And yeah. now Democracy Watch has an Instagram account, so no one needs traditional <laughs> journalism anymore. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this eclectic episode of Democracy Watch. This is our final episode for the school year. Um, the reason I say the school year is because we may still do da, 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 that was da, a drum da, roll. Da, 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 da. Uh, we may still do a condensed or less frequent version of Democracy Watch over the summer. Uh, summer. Summer. Yeah, this from like a collective <laughs> groan from the audience. Oh my <laughs> like, oh, god. Oh. No, the audience is thrilled. Um, <laughs> so yeah, ends. so stay tuned on social media for updates on when that and if that smaller version of Democracy Watch will continue existing because we do love covering local news and we have to get off the air now but thank you so much we for have listening. Cake to eat. We have cake to eat. Uh, come by, by the station. Wait for us with bated breath. <laughs> if you listener want some cake come by CITR 101.9 FM and you can have some cake. That's our promise to you. Is that a security this is, issue? This is no. This is Vancouver's number one source of community adversarial News mostly run by volunteers, and based on those categories, I think that's true. Mm-hmm. Okay, have a great night. Ola's like, get off the air. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.